अनुसंधान ऑल गुजरात इंटीग्रेटेड क्लासरूम सैटेलाइट ना माध्यम थी जोड़ती कड़ी एटले संधान हेलो स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ स्पेशल इंग्लिश एंड वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक टुडे अबाउट अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग पर्सन हु इज बीन द बैकबोन ऑफ लिटरेरी क्रिटिसिज्म इन इंग्लिश एंड दिस पर्सन हैज बीन सो इन्फ्लुएंशियल throughout the history of literature language and critical thinking in the entire western civilization this is none other than plato we have with us in the studio dr urmila patel who is a professor at ha college of commerce with me i am jean de souza also a professor at ha college of commerce and we are going to have some kind of a discussion some kind of a dialogue and a lecture on this greatly influential thinker philosopher plato as you can see on the slide plato has been a very powerful man his picture his impression or his image itself shows you the strength of his character he was born in 427 bc and he died in 348 or 47 bc we are not sure of the dates because uh, documentation was not available in th- to that degree of precision at the time plato was a student of socrates the apology which plato wrote was a representation of what socrates said at his trial is the clearest picture we have of the historical socrates so uh, as you can see in the picture also that is socrates the pic- the man who is sitting in the center with his students all around him and interestingly as the picture shows he was about to drink his hemlock as it's called his cup of poison because he was sentenced to death and this was how people at that time used to be ki- uh, killed you can say or sentenced to death they had to drink this poison and socrates as uh, at the end of his life was uh, as powerful as strong and as unafraid as he was throughout his life okay uh, excuse me ma'am i just would like uh, you to explain further why was he sentenced to death he was sentenced to death because he had very radical ideas which were not uh, in line with the current thinking of the time uh, 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 was it against the society or the hierarchy or uh, maybe the rulers um, or politically you could say that but his ideas basically encouraged a certain kind of thinking which didn't fall in line with subservient subjects in an autocratic or a or a uh, it wasn't autocratic really but in in a rule in a country which was ruled with authority the kind of ideas that socrates had the kind of thinking that he encouraged was a thinking which uh, allowed or aroused a lot of a lot of individuality within people and because of this particular uh, kind of mentality that socrates was not only having within himself but also encouraging within his students his the people who were listening to him or his followers because of this kind of an mentality which he was encouraging he was sentenced to death so in a th- uh, in a sense he was a threat to the general idea of society or <laughs> was he uh, in a sense a threat to the ruler the kingdoms no 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 he wasn't a threat to the ruler but yes he was a threat to uh, organized society okay he he could if he wanted to shift or move the order he is what we would call in today's world a mover and a shaker of the society of the okay. time someone uh, who leads the society in a different direction yes. maybe a leader kind of a yes, guru yes a guru a yeah. leader but a leader who was very radical very different from how the the guru, people the, at the that word time guru. were uh, living okay. so plato was a student of such a radical man socrates and the work that plato wrote called the apology is 
a representation of what Socrates said. So the apology was written by Plato, but it was a representation of his teacher Socrates' ideas. And um, in this book, we have the clearest picture of the historical Socrates that is possible. Socrates, as you can see, lived from 469 BC to 399 BC. In 388, Plato returned to Athens and founded a school of his own, the academy, where young men could pursue advanced studies. The school is often described as the first university. Yeah, so students, as you know, now that you are going to university and having your own academic uh, qualifications furthered and developing your own studies, Plato was the one who started the first university in the West, in the Western um, civilization. And this university was called the Academy. Uh, Madam, you might like to tell us a little bit about universities in India, uh, the old universities. Uh, the old universities in India was uh, specially when uh, under the rule of King Ashoka. And that was Takshila and Nalanda. Nalanda and Chanakya was supposed to be the founder of those two schools of and they are as such uh, known as seat of learning till today. Right. Mm -hmm. So it comparable to Chanakya actually you could you could compare we could compare at some point the status of Plato was similar to the status of Chanakya. Ch Chanakya advisor, uh, philosopher, uh, uh, philosopher and, and advisor both. Right. So, this school which we are talking about now, the Platonic uh, school called the Academy was this place of learning that, that Plato established and this is where young people could pursue their studies, could go and learn and research and, and discuss and get, get taught as well as talk about whatever subject that uh, they wanted to discuss. Excuse me madam, at this point I would like to uh, make one more clarification. This Academy uh, was in the similar frame of a gurukul where the teacher and the students they live together or it was uh, in a uh, frame as present like the te teachers and the students do not spend uh, like 24 hours together. I think it was a place where people lived, lived and, and uh, studied because we have a little bit of information about Aristotle, who we are going to talk about very soon, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who came here and lived here for an, around uh, 20, 30, 40 years of his life. So I think it was a place where people came and lived as they learned. I think the idea of the university in the past has always been a place like this, where you where you can go and reside and have your own uh, learning that takes place. It's It's only today that in the modern times we have a university where we go and we leave by the time by the end of the day but most of the universities in ancient times seem to be universities which we would call residential universities where you would go and you would <coughs> live for mm -hmm. for some time in most of the many books that he wrote during his long life plato continued <coughs> to feature socrates as the principal speaker in philosophical dialogues that explored the ethical and political problems of the age. So basically Plato's books talk about Socrates. It is not that Plato writes books about his own ideas. He does write books about his, his, own, his own thoughts and his own ideas. But in all of his books, if he had to make a person speak a certain way or, or give a certain kind of reasoning or a dialogue, Socrates, his teacher, would be the principal speaker. Now this is interesting because Socrates was not alive after uh, Plato started writing books most of the time so it Socrates was uh, not present at all in fact he was already dead during the half the life that Plato had lived but even then Plato keeps Socrates in his books alive as the central character who would be talking about the philosophical or the ideological dialogues that they had at the time. Uh, Madam, I think uh, 
he was uh, it the dialogue the form of the book is dialogue basically yes. uh, do you think that he feared uh, the same fate of his guru and he could not openly speak about his ideas i mean it is through socrates mouth he is presenting hmm. his own hmm. ideas hmm. basically hmm. Hmm. so do you think uh, somewhere um i don't know if there was the fear that he had of uh, having meeting the same fate of being sentenced to death just like his guru was or socrates was sentenced to death because socrates himself was not a fearful man so i'm sure that uh, the the fear of death did not really occur but because the style of writing was such basically plato uh, was a a rhetorician he was what we would call some kind of a debater some kind of a dialogue uh, person who would need to have two sides of the story represent both sides of an issue for example and write or talk about the two different sides therefore you needed to have two people talking in a book and because you needed to have two people talking one person would be always for plato his teacher socrates right Plato's ideas and dialogues were written in books of which the Republic was the most famous were present uh, preserved in their uh, entirety and have exerted an enormous influence on western thought ever since okay. the republic is the main book that we are going to discuss we are going to talk about this is a book in which plato's ideas and dialogues were written it is a book importantly in which plato talks about what should be according to him an ideal republic it is a book in which he describes the perfect kind of a state that he would dream of or he would want he idealized a certain kind of a state a certain kind of a country and it is this country that uh, plato discusses in the republic madam if you remember rabindranath tagore has written a poem of an ideal country where he talks where the about the mind is without fear exactly he, he talks about the ideal country where he would with the kind of india okay. that he would dream of dream of he would want now this book that plato is talking about the republic is a book in which he describes not with emotion but with a very very strong sense of reason with a very very strong rationality the kind of republic he would want to be in or the kind of republic which is ideal which is perfect why art according to plato art is unreal untrue unhealthy now this was the first thing or this is the main thing that we are going to be talking about today because this is where we come across a meeting point of plato's ideal republic and literature or art plato says that in an ideal republic all artists all kinds of artists should be banned should be removed should not exist in an ideal republic why did he say so no he wasn't like the taliban and no he wasn't negating or he wasn't like hitler who wanted to eliminate all kinds of uh, people but according to plato he had very strong reasoning he had very strong logic and he argued that art or poetry is what he calls art art forms and poetry arouse certain passions in a in a reader in a viewer or in a listener and these passions that are aroused because of art forms make a person unstable make a person shake from within and because of this instability produced by art he believed that an ideal republic should not have artists because when we are talking about an ideal republic the persons in it the citizens of an ideal republic those who exist in an ideal republic should be completely stable 
whereas art and poetry in particular makes a person unstable how does art do this how does art make us unstable art makes us unstable according to plato because of arousing emotions which make you shake which shake you up which move you which bring you sometimes to tears which make you happy sometimes more than necessary which take you probably transport you into a different level of existence and because art does these things according to plato art should not be allowed or should not be encouraged in an ideal republic he writes that there are two realms a realm of forms or ideas containing the perfect form of everything and the material realm in which these forms or ideas are imperfectly replicated so going on to explain how art is unreal or untrue he says first of all that there are two kinds of realms two levels of existence at one level there is the perfect world where everything is perfect now this perfect world exists at a plane of ideology exists at a plane of imagination at a higher realm and then we have the realm of the reality around us as we see in which there are always imperfections in which there are always things that are incomplete not perfect okay and these are the two realms that plato talks about uh excuse me i would like uh, you to still explain it this further uh, the perfect form is perfect from which angle does it uh, uh, indicate uh, towards the perfection or the idea of perfection that plato had in his mind or there is something else which even plato has not seen um the idea of perfection is the that plato is probably talking about is an ideological um, in my opinion sometimes even imaginary perfection it is a perfection which perhaps plato has not seen with his own eyes but can easily use uh, an uh, an imagination to idealize it is an ideological realm is what as what they call it so it's basically it is his perception of something that is ideal yes it is a perceptive ideological realm and according to plato plato generalizes the whole theory and says that this realm exists universally okay in the universe there are two realms one realm is a realm of perfection and one realm is a realm of the reality Repl that we have around us now to explain the realm my dear students this is a very very important picture that you should remember because plato has explained the realm through this image in this image plato has shown his theory of the caves okay this is not an image which plato himself has drawn it is a it is a representation of plato's theory and this is why we need to remember or to to look at this image very very closely plato says that our existence is represented by the cave we are all living in a cave okay the prisoners is what human beings are we are the prisoners in this cave and we live over here as you can see the cursor is moving there this is all of us who are sitting and watch uh, looking or existing in this world now while we are over here while our existence is here we need to remember that we are tied up over here this is a tied up existence we cannot move you cannot get up and go for a walk you're tied up over here and you are forced to sit here facing this wall that you can see this wall is what we are uh, looking at the reality that we see is on this wall it is shadows on this wall the reality is shown to us as shadows that are cast on this wall here now where are the shadows coming from the shadows are coming from this place where there are puppets who are performing 
there is a place here for puppets to perform and these puppets who are performing here have a fire which is behind them the, this over here as you can see students is the fire because of the light of the fire the light of the fire falls on the puppets over here and because of the light falling on the puppets the shadows are cast on the wall that you see in front of the prisoners who are sitting over there so this is the cave that plato talks about there is a way out of this cave but that can only be probably after we die maybe when we ascend into the sunlight when we go out of the cave into the sunlight and see complete light or complete truth now when we when plato was talking about this theory it's a very abstract theory and because of its abstraction it needed to have a certain metaphor a certain simile to explain this whole abstract theory and this is why he uses the theory of the cave it's a very interesting image my dear students and if you see it you will realize what exactly plato is talking about you will you will understand it very very clearly there is a fire at the back the fire is at right at the back in front of the fire is the roadway where the showmen are performing where the puppets are performing and the shadows of the puppets who perform fall on the wall over here and all of us you me all of us sit over here and watch the shadows that are falling on this wall so what we, reality we see around us what we see of the world around us is simply shadows on a wall <coughs> this is another uh, slide another picture of the same the same theory but with a different image with a different drawing as you can see there is a fire over here and then there are puppets and showmen who are showing certain puppets of a cat and certain puppet of a table or a puppet of a chair and the shadows of these various things are falling on the wall the shadows are cast on the wall and there are people who are sitting over here the prisoners who cannot look behind to see what is happening but who can only look forward and see the various shapes that are formed on this wall and this is plato's theory of the caves plato believes that our reality in this world our existence in this world is like the shadows that are cast on the wall what i see around me the mountains and the trees and the nature around me or the furniture that i see in my house or the the kind of roads and and uh, um industries and shops that i see around me all of these things are simply shadows they are not the real things the real things are happening somewhere else but the shadow of that those things are falling on the wall in front of us and so we look at them and we we tend to think sometimes that these are real but actually according to plato these are simply shadows madam does this remind you of the maya theory uh, in indian uh, civilization yes krishna says jagat mithya mm -hmm. so everything is unreal mm -hmm. the truth is something different mm -hmm. is something not seen mm -hmm. and uh, that is why uh, mm, in hinduism basically uh, people detach themselves from the maya that is created which is misleading them from the real goal or the salvation or hmm. moksha so in hinduism or in in uh, indian uh, culture the way out of the cave is through detachment uh, through detachment uh, through uh, moving into your own center on your own self and concentrating on uh, you being a part of the divinity you have mm. to realize that you too is brahma okay. the moment you realize your brahmasmi you become one with the god okay and there's a way of salvation or maybe merger with the absolute truth okay so there are certain lines of similarity though i i am sure that plato was not a religious person as such so plato doesn't talk about religion as such but there are certain lines of similarity in the philosophy that we have 
in the in the theory in the argument or in this ideology of the caves the theory of the caves where everything is a shadow on the wall and the idea of maya where everything is an illusion that you see around you and the only way out is to come out of this cave into the bright sunlight or into the truth so plato's theory of the cave indicated basically that whatever reality that we see what we think of as reality whatever we are looking at around us is simply an imitation now what does an artist do an artist when he starts writing about let's say an artist or a poet is writing a poem about a tree when the poet is writing this poem about a tree the poet is not really looking at the real tree what is the poet looking at the poet is looking at a tree which is an imitation of the perfect tree which exists in the realm of perfection the poet is looking at a tree which is a copy which is a duplicate you can say of the tree which is perfect which exists in the realm of perfection so what does the poet do when the poet is writing about this duplicate tree the poet in his work or in his poetry is creating a third tree which is a copy of the duplicate tree and because the third tree is a copy of the duplicate tree the poet's tree is twice removed from reality and the reader who reads that poem creates an Im image or an impression in the reader's mind about that tree and thus we have a third tree which is a copy of the copy of the copy so there is a thrice removed reality when the reader reads it because of this according to plato art then is untrue it's not true because what you're looking at is only shadows and what the artist does is recreating a shadow and what the reader or the viewer or the spectator does is re recreates a shadow again and therefore according to plato art is false it's not true and this was plato's major argument against art forms uh, was it uh, for even paintings or uh, sculptures yes. or anything yes plato writes poetry when he writes in the republic mm -hmm. but he means it for everything else every uh, any any form every of art, art form but one thing i really fail to understand over here the tree that a poet sees or gets inspiration from it is not a creation of somebody else it is a god's creation or maybe uh, some universal power okay so again it is the idea it is it is the uh, reality of that creator okay. and if you see a reality of a different creator and you uh, create another image or maybe a tree in uh, your poetry or something do you think it is equally the same removed from the reality no it is it is not the same th tree that you are seeing but according to plato plato as i said was not a religious person in that sense he was a philosopher what he thought was that the tree that we are writing about let's say it's a peepal tree or it's a banyan tree suppose i write a poem about a banyan tree that banyan tree is simply a duplicate image of a perfect banyan tree that exists somewhere else plato does, does not think of it in terms of god he does not think of it in terms of of a uh, creator he looks at it simply as an idea of perfection that exists somewhere else at another realm basically that was the first step that we took if you remember students we said that plato says there are two realms there is the realm of what we see and touch and feel here but there is also a realm of ideas that plato is talking about so when plato talks about the the other realm and how this particular banyan tree is a copy of that perfect tree he is talking about the banyan tree being a replica or an image or a copy of the perfect tree that perfect tree that exists somewhere else the idea of the tree 
the idea of a tree may not be a banyan tree at all it may be a tree in general what we are seeing here is a tree in particular the the tree the banyan tree is a tree in particular the peepal tree is a another particular tree but the neem tree the gulmohar tree these are all particulars but there is one realm which is of the ideas the realm of perfection where there is the universal tree the general tree okay. not the particular tree as you can see in this slide as well uh plato's conception of forms and things you can see that there is one realm of the form of good and from this realm come different different forms or from this form of perfect good there come different forms for example there is the form of a table the form of the table is perfect in this realm of ideas but from this realm of ideas come other forms or other tables which are the coffee table the dining table or the computer table or any other desk or table that you can think of these are the particulars these are the general the universal then there is another example of the form of justice from the form of justice we have other forms that other particular things that come out which is the constitution or the bills or or trials or sentences or so on similarly there is a form of the cat from the perfect cat you have particular cats like whatever name you want to give your cat gulliver or kellogg's or mitty or billy or whatever else you want to call your particular cat so basically plato's conception of form and things is a conception in which there is one level of ideal form you can see the dark line on your screen which divides the two realms so there is one level of ideal forms and uh, and then there is the other level of particular forms or real forms that you can see below the dark line according to plato each particular object is a reflection of a form the form is more real than the particular object in fact the form is the source of the particular object so as we said there are two realms there is one level of a realm of perfection according to this realm each particular object is a reflection of one form so if we have one form which is the ideal form let's say of the cat or the ideal form of a table that is the ideal level the re realm of ideas from this when we come into this world that realm of ideas gets translated or gets converted into particular objects so we have a particular table a dining table a study table or a student's table a desk in your in your college where you sit these tables are translations you can say or conversions into particular forms of that ideal table that exists in the world of ideas there is a perfect table which exists in the world of ideas and that perfect table is the source through which these uh, particular tables are produced through through which the particular tables come this is again a very simply put uh, slide in which you can see very clear very simply and very easily there is the highest form of good from the highest form come ideal forms of different objects or different things and from the different ideal forms you get the particular forms so there is a highest form and it is interesting to note how plato in all his theory does talk about one highest good form he does talk about one perfect form from which other perfect forms come out he talks about the perfect form in all his theories in which there is the level in the level of ideas there is a perfect singular form through whom the different forms come up so even though plato did not claim to be a religious person even though plato claimed to be 
a philosopher and not not a religious propagandist yet you can see how there is the influence of that one object or that one thing one perfect form of good that he talks about the form is absolute the particular are relative and qualified example the tiny ant when he talks about he gives this example of a tiny ant he says that the perfect form in the realm of forms the form is absolute the particulars they are relative and qualified now how what does he say he says that the ant is tiny okay so we talk about the tiny ant in terms of being small in our world we call an ant small or we call an ant tiny and the ant is tiny yes but it is tiny only when we compare it with ourselves or we compare it with an elephant then the ant is tiny but what about if you compare the ant with a speck of sand as you can see in the slide the speck of sand is smaller than the ant right and because the speck of sand is smaller than the ant now the ant does not remain tiny at all the ant becomes bigger than the speck of sand so in our world of particulars in this world that we have around us the world of shadows as plato calls it in this world these things these particulars become relative they all become qualified you can call an ant tiny but you cannot say that it has it is the tiniest object no it is not it is not perfectly tiny it is not perfectly small it is small only when you relate it with a human being or you relate it with another animal or another insect or a larger object or a larger object and it is not small when you relate it with a, a sand, sand or uh, maybe a grain or some yes so this is what plato says that the form is absolute so if i want to talk about a tiny ant in the realm of ideas there is a perfectly tiny ant without comparison without qualification that ant is perfectly tiny but as soon as we come into this world of reality we start immediately saying it is tiny but it is not tiny as compared to sand but it is not tiny as compared to a grain and it is tiny only when compared to an elephant and so on so this is how plato says that the first thing is that in the world of ideas in the world of in the realm of ideas the form is perfect the tininess or the form of that tininess is perfect whereas as soon as you come into this reality it becomes relative it becomes qualified uh, as you was in comparison uh, i remember sometimes back we had talked about it uh, the uh, whiteness no yes. when you start uh, comparing yes. the color white whom would we call a perfect white yes okay it may be in relation with something yes. else then only oh, it's whiter than this yes. it's darker than this exactly. or is brighter than this but there cannot be one particular yes white color color which we call it as a perfect color exactly. but which exist in the realm uh, of ideas realm of ideas but in my head or in your mind or even the student who is watching this in the mind of the student there is a perfect white the student knows for example what is the color white but the minute you show me a white colored cloth or a white colored sheet of paper i will immediately say perhaps that yes it is white but it is not as white as my sheet or i may say like in the famous advertisement mere jaisa white nahi hai yes so i might say things like this which might make that whole whiteness relative relative then in this slide you will see that the form is perfect the particulars are always flawed in some of the other way example two glasses filled with same amount of water may not be same yes as such yes uh -huh. exactly so the form is perfect but the particulars are flawed 
now if i have in my mind the example that is given is that if i have in my mind two glasses of water okay if i have it in my mind then they are perfectly equal two glasses of water but the minute i fill them up with real water i i take real glasses and fill them up with real water then i am sure that if you measure them even though they look uh, to be the same but if you measure them there might be one drop more or one drop less in both the glasses so <coughs> i'm sorry as soon as you come into the reality that the the kind of the world that you are looking around you then the form becomes perfect the form is perfect but the particulars that we have are imperfect they are flawed in some way or the other the forms are eternal and unchanging the particulars are affected by time and therefore temporary and changing example the flowers that wither so if i tell you to imagine a flower then you have a certain flower in your mind that flower in your mind never withers never fades never dies never uh, is never destroyed it remains a blooming flower all the time but if i tell you to show me a real flower or a flower in reality that in this world around me i am sure that flower after a couple of days or after a couple of hours according to the flower will wither or will die so plato says that the form of the flower is perfect it never withers it never changes but the reality that we see of the particular flower in front of us changes or can be changed can be destroyed plato used the idea of the cave to explain this highly abstract theory but how do we know that the form exists why should we consider the forms to be true what grounds do we have to believe that the realm of forms ex actually exist now this is a question that most people would come to uh, when they talk to when they talk about plato's theory how do we know that forms really exist plato says they exist plato says that there is a re realm of ideas but how are we so sure that there is this realm of ideas what makes the realm of ideas uh, really true or real i mean it's just an it's just a theory right that's what people would say but to answer this one of plato's key argument is the one over many argument plato says consider different beautiful things so let's say you imagine maybe a beautiful woman maybe you imagine uh, katrina kaif or uh, deepika padukone and or you uh, imagine maybe a beautiful poem or a song that you know or you imagine a beautiful flower maybe in your mind you imagine these different different beautiful things now they are all different right the woman is different the flower is different and the song is different yet at a certain level in your mind the idea of what makes them all beautiful the idea of beauty according to plato remains the same the things may be differently beautiful the woman may be beautiful because she is dressed in a certain way or she has a certain shape or a size or she smiles in a certain way the flower is beautiful because it has a beautiful color or a shape and the song is beautiful because you feel happy when you sing it or you like to listen to the music they are all beautiful in different ways but the idea of beauty in all these things remains the same uh, uh do you think the idea of beauty you find anything be uh, beautiful because it uh, appeals to your senses is again uh, your sense perception yes it may not be the same for me yes. or it may it may be different from uh, person yes. to person yes but yes what you say the idea, idea of beauty of remains remains the same so uh, my idea of beauty may be black in color your idea of beauty may be yellow in, in color. color but the idea in my mind and the realm of ideas the beauty the idea of mm, beauty, beauty is that form that is what plato says look at this slide all these beautiful things though different and separate have one common quality they are all beautiful they all contain the quality of beauty 
Now we know that beautiful things could be more beautiful or less beautiful. But the idea of beauty is always perfect. So you see that the idea of beauty remains as a perfect idea in your mind. It's in your mind. It's not in my mind and it's not in anyone else's mind. It's in your mind. And that idea that you have in your mind of how things should be or how things you would like them to be, that is what we are talking about in terms of uh, beauty and in terms of Plato. Also, we know that beautiful things may come and go. The flower may wither, the woman may die, the song may become boring, but the idea of beauty persists. It does not change. So the realm of ideas, in the realm of ideas, the idea of beauty or the idea that we have remains the same. You can replace beauty with any other concept. You can replace beauty with the idea of truth. Or you can replace beauty and truth with the idea of a table. Or you can replace the idea of a table with the idea of a design. With the idea of a perfect smile maybe. But the idea in the realm of ideas, these perfect things remain always the same. They don't change. They don't become old or grow boring or become different. They remain the same. So it seems that beauty must be something more than the particular objects and we find beautiful. That something more is the form. Thus the form is beyond and more than the particular object. Yes. So in every of all of these particular objects, there is something that makes them beautiful, something extra that makes them beautiful. That something extra is the idea. That something extra is the form. And that is how Plato proves that the forms actually exist. He says that in everything beautiful, you see something that makes them more beautiful. Why do I find, for example, why do I find the rose more beautiful than the mogra? Because there is something in that rose that makes me find, uh, makes it more beautiful for me. That something more is what Plato calls the form. There are problems though with Plato's theory. The theory of forms itself can be an imitation of a form. Just as the, uh, there exist the forms of truth, beauty and good things, there must also be a negative heaven somewhere which contains the forms of negative things in the world like ugliness, hatred and filth. Plato does not mention these in his ideal world. So these are two of the objections, the simple objections that are there with Plato's theory. One theory is that just as Plato says that the there are two realms of the ideal and the, uh, the worldly realm, in the ideal realm there must be an ideal theory of forms also. Just as Plato's theory could have been a pro perfect theory in the ideal realm. What about that ideal theory? That means what we are discussing also is an imitation of an ideal theory. And the other uh, objection to Plato's theory is that just as there are ideas of perfection which exist, there are also ideas of imperfection. There are also ideas of negativity that exist ideas of ugliness for example you can't only say that there is beauty in the world there is also ugliness ugliness there is also pollution and dirt what about those is there a negative heaven or a negative realm of ideas for them we do not know plato does not mention the negatives in his theory plato has been highly influential in christianity and the western civilization in fact it has been said that the entire European philosophical tradition is simply a series of footnotes to Plato. All philosophical debates are somehow connected with Plato's theory. And therefore, we now come to the conclusion of this lecture, my dear students. We hope you have had as much fun as we have had in discussing Plato with you. Uh, basically, what you need to remember is Plato's book, called the Republic in which he writes about how art is untrue, un, uh, unhealthy because it takes you away 
from the one reality which is beyond this world of shadows beyond the world of caves we will move now next we are looking forward to the next lecture in which we talk about aristotle and his defense of art thank you thank you Sandham All Gujarat Integrated Classroom Satellite na madhyam thi jodti kadi etle sandhan 